Hello and welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today we'll be asking what lessons has Israel learnt from Operation Pillar Defence in which we saw the Israeli Air Force um, target Hamas's military and uh, terrorist infrastructure in Gaza and we'll be asking will the ceasefire hold between Israel and Hamas. The second part of the program will be looking at uh, Mohammed Abbas, the uh, Palestinian Authority's leader's uh, bid to seek Palestinian non-member status at the UN this week. We'll be asking what implications does this have for the Middle East peace process and the future of Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations. To join me to ask these very significant questions, I'm joined by a, a regular on the Middle East report, uh, Jerry Lewis, who is a parliamentary journalist and the London correspondent for Israel Radio and the political and diplomatic editor of the Jewish Telegraph. Jerry, pleasure to have you on the programme again. Nice to be back with you. Now, last week uh, was uh, an intense um, week, I think, for everyone involved in the work of um, Israel advocacy. Um, can you share with some of our viewers some things that you got up to last week in really what was probably the uh, the heat of the storm in terms of Israel's military offensive against Hamas? Well, there were, in fact, two areas of my concern. One was to watch what was being said in Parliament and report on it, of course. And we had the big statement of William Hague made last Tuesday. Uh, and during that, he made very clear Israel has a right to defend itself, though he did warn proportionality, and it's always been a question and a half, what is proportional, what is not proportional. Uh, the Labour Party took a slightly different stance and they triggered off a debate on whether Israel has a, r a right to, to oppose and what Britain's stance would be the, Brit the United Nations bid by the Palestinians, which we'll discuss a, a little later. But that was one area of concern. The second area was uh, watching very closely how the media reported, and especially the electronic media. Uh, I'm not an expert on the social networking area, and it's not something I spend much time myself looking at. But what I was concerned about is how most people today get their news, which is television and radio, and to see how the different TV stations and radio cover the events, how they reported, was it fair? Was it balanced? Um, in my setup at home, I have, in fact, four television screens in front of me, one on the BBC domestic, one on BBC World, one on Sky, and one on CNN, which I can also flick over to Al Jazeera, uh, Russia Today, the French station, if I need to. But basically, those four stations were watched very closely by me most of the time, just to see what went on. And what was your conclusion <coughs> from watching many of the uh, mainstream news coverage of this conflict? The BBC came out of it far better than I had anticipated they might. There's always been criticism of the BBC's coverage of the Middle East, and it was very instructive that on Wednesday night, this last week, I went to the Palestine Solidarity Campaign meeting, where, surprisingly enough, I'm always made to feel very welcome, and one of the major complaints made by the organisers of Palestine Solidarity is how biased the BBC is towards Israel. Uh, the view of the Jewish community is that the BBC is biased towards the Palestinians. I think the BBC, in fact, with one or two exceptions, had a very good war. They placed Ben Brown, a very experienced reporter, on the Israeli side of the border between Israel and Gaza, and his reporting with three or four colleagues was excellent. Um, the one or two correspondents they had based in Gaza most of the time were good, though Ian Donison, who's basically their West Bank and Gaza correspondent on a permanent basis, did screw up, and it's putting it politely, when he used his Twitter account, so I'm told, to send a photograph of a two-year-old girl who allegedly had been injured, except to discover not very long afterwards that the photograph was in fact from the Syrian conflict and nothing to do with Gaza at all, and he had to admit straight away that he had screwed up. Um, the only concern on the BBC coverage was Jeremy Bowen, their BBC Middle East editor, with whom I've had run-ins, and many have in the past, and his initial assessment, which was that Israel had 
acted without any provocation, without uh, any mention of what had preceded the Israeli action, um, really stuck in the throat. Representations were made to the BBC, and after that he certainly modified and altered his style of reporting, though there were quite frequent lapses. But he isn't the only reporter in the area, and the reporters on the ground did do a very fair portrayal, in my view, of what went on. Sky were a far better team. They always have been. Um, they don't have the hang-ups that the BBC seems to have. And CNN, well, they plug it into their American coverage, so it wasn't a, just a, a world coverage. It was domestic and world. And pretty well they did what is expected of a CNN coverage with an American slant. I mean, I mean if we compare... Um, <coughs> two major events that uh, one's taking place and one's just stopped now between um, Israel's military offensive against Hamas in Gaza and that of the brutality of uh, Bash al-Assad's regime in Syria, for example, and the amount of media coverage that once Israel's involved in a conflict, it was only really became a news story once Israel started to retaliate to um, Hamas's provocation, became a news story. Uh, and then we're seeing the, the slaughter of innocents and uh, death of thousands of people in Syria, and yet this is really not very high up on the news agenda. Why is it that when it comes to Israel, there's a disproportionate amount of news coverage than there is other conflicts in the Middle East? Good, good question. The easiest answer, and the, in fact a fair answer, is that access to Israel for the media is infinitely easier than it is in the Syrian context. Um, you will just have to recall what difficulties there were to get BBC and other reporters in and out of Damascus towards the beginning of the conflict, how a number of journalists, including the Sunday Times and Marie Colvin, lost her life. Very few journalists were injured and, or affected by this incident in Gaza. The big problem is, for any journalist, they have a very limited amount of time to make their reports. One and a half, two minutes, sometimes two and a half, occasionally three. <clears throat> and in that time, to put a story into context is not always easy. And I have to give credit to those journalists that try to. But when taken up with the heat of the moment and some of the distressing scenes they see on either side of the divide, it is quite conceivable that they f overlook the other events which have led to the incidents. And if it's not put into context, then the viewer misses out. Um, sadly, the events which preceded the Gaza invasion, or when I say invasion, but the military attacks by Israel to protect its own people, all the rocket attacks which had happened before had virtually no coverage on domestic or overseas or BBC World services programmes, no mention on ITN, virtually nothing on CNN, and therefore to the man in the street, the first they knew that there was problems in Gaza was in fact Israel moving in and taking out a terrorist leader who had directly been involved in the launching of rockets. Simple and s as that. The actual scale of events started, in fact, the previous week when four Israeli soldiers in a jeep ran over the end of a tunnel, were blown up, they were one of them badly injured, three others less seriously so. Then there was a, a barrage of rockets coming over, 120 in just a couple of days, a weekend non-stop of rocketing, Israeli kids being forced to stop going to school, people literally being in shelters most of the time. It was just an impossible situation. Israelis registered throughout the country and across the political divide that Netanyahu, the Israeli Premier, had to act, and act he did. He sent in the planes, and there was no question the army was all geared up. There were enough reservists ready to move into Israel, sorry, from Israel into Gaza, had that proved to be necessary. And he held that point as not a, a gun to the international community, but as a warning to everybody that unless the Hamas organisation got a grip within Gaza, 
there would be consequences. And he was prepared to take that next step, no question. And uh, we, we've now thankfully had a ceasefire <coughs> that's been managed to hold now for, for over a week, which is good news. Um, what does this mean now for um, Israel's uh, southern citizens, those living in the south, those within the range of Hamas's rockets and missiles? Do you think now we're going to see some sort of um, peace and safety for those communities? Well, we'd like to think so. Hamas, for the first day, were a bit hit and miss, if we can put it that way, in terms of policing the ceasefire. A few rockets did come across to Israel after the ceasefire commenced, but those have tended to cease since. So one has left with just this very eerie feeling that for the moment things are OK. The big worry is not just those in the radius of 15 to 20 miles of Gaza's borders who have been constantly barraged with rockets, but those much further afield now, in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, two typical examples where it's quite clear their new rocketry, which has come through the Egyptian Gaza border, is able and capable to reach Israel's main population centres. Now, those people living in a short distance from Gaza have 15 seconds, very little time indeed, from the sounding of an air warning, air, uh, air siren, to get into a shelter. Those in Tel Aviv have maybe a minute and a half. Nowhere in Israel has got more than three minutes notice of such an attack. And we have to not overlook as well that Hezbollah is fully now armed. They have at least, so it is estimated, 55,000 missiles, rockets, all at the ready to attack from the north. So this was a real game changer as far as the Israelis were concerned. They could see that many of their population centres are at real risk and they were very concerned and remain concerned that if this little conflict is going to have any long-term consequences, the Prime Minister of Israel has got to deliver a peace which holds. And on that, they're very much reliant on the Egyptians. Just for, don't overlook the first person into Gaza, the first international leader into Gaza was the Egyptian Prime Minister, which made him almost party pre to the conflict. Muslim Brotherhood runs Egypt now. They've allowed the border to be opened for massive amounts of weaponry to get in. But at the same time, they are critical to the peace process in terms of producing some form of settlement with Hamas. Without them, there'd have been absolutely no agreement at all. The, uh, Mohammed Abbas, with his Palestinian authority in Ramallah, absolutely out of the equation. They had virtually no say in what went on in Gaza. So the Egyptians are still key to what's going on. And the uh, Mr. Barsi, who is the president of Egypt, is very much aware, with massive poverty, thoroughly reliant on American money to keep his country going, he's got to understand he has to at least toe the line to some degree, and that means maintaining some form of peace with e Israel, even if it's a cold peace, but at the same time, he has his domestic duties to, and he, we've seen how difficulties he's had with people protesting in Tahrir Square, he's had his domestic difficulties in trying to ensure that he can keep his people together, and they are I won't say baying for blood, but certainly far more hostile towards Israel than they've been hitherto. And uh, we've got a clip to go to now that looks at how uh, Jewish communities are rebuilding themselves after a week of uh, intensive missile and rocket fire on Israel's southern communities. Social workers in southern Israel are pleading with the Israeli government for more help in dealing with the damage after Operation Pillar of Defense, according to a letter sent to the Finance and Social Affairs ministers. During the eight-day military conflict with Hamas, the Gaza-based militants fired some 1,400 rockets at southern Israel. Some 900 of those rockets struck southern Israel, tragically killing five Israelis. 
Approximately one million Israelis live in southern Israel, which received the majority of the rocket attacks, and many of them need help dealing with post-traumatic stress as well as reimbursement for property damage caused by missile strikes. The Hebrew newspaper The Marker estimates that compensation for Israeli citizens will total around 260 million U.S. dollars. In response, Jewish groups such as the Jewish Federations of North America are raising money to help cover the cost for those in need in Israel. Along with the financial needs, there is also a shortage of manpower, with the latest parliamentary report from 2010 noting a shortage of about 1,000 social workers in Israel. The head of the country's social workers union says that without more aid workers, social services will be unable to provide quick treatment for residents of affected areas. Hello and welcome back to uh, the Middle East Report. Um, Jerry, also want to say that uh, really uh, it seems very clear that Iran was very much behind um, uh, fueling this conflict with Hamas by supplying these long-range missiles and rockets, certainly the ones that uh, targeted Tel Aviv and uh, Jerusalem, as we saw last week. Um, how is it absolutely essential that uh, the West and Israel prevent the rearming of Hamas? and prevent the supply of Iranian weapons to Hamas to stop future conflicts? Whilst Israel would like to be able to stop the rearming of Hamas, sadly it knows that it no longer has that ability because it no longer patrols the border between these Gazan and Egyptians. Um, the problems now have multiplied since the Egyptian authorities have shown less willingness to do the work that the previous Egyptian administration under Mubarak used to do. Uh, they used to keep a very tight rein on those tunnels. Whilst they couldn't stop everything, um, they made sure that the tunnels' entrances were patrolled and even if they could see what was going on, they sometimes th th uh, put a closed eye on what actually was being smuggled in. Some of it was food, some of it was uh, disguised as food and whatever. The new regime is far less uh, restrictive. The gates between the two sides are open quite regularly. Uh, the new Egyptian government have even uh, flouted the agreements between Israel and the Egyptians over what armaments can be in that area because of the terrorist threat. But the Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt, it still has yet to find its feet. It's still finding great difficulties looking after its own people. And therefore, the Gaza border isn't one of its major priorities at the moment. Where does it leave Israel? Israel knows that if it's going to have peace in the region, it's going to have to get together with the Palestinians, but not the Hamas Farati. Iran cynically and probably deliberately chose the period immediately after the American elections to try and flex their muscles for two reasons. One, because the attention of the world is diverting away from what's going on elsewhere, and that principally is Syria. But second of all, they know that the elections are coming up in Israel as well. Not that this is a major factor, but that people are thinking about who to vote for within the Israeli system, and whatever they want, whatever way they want to, to put the heat up in Israel, producing a conflict which puts Netanyahu and his people under stress, as far as they would be concerned, a good idea. It's a not thought, it's an idea, what evidence we have for it, it's difficult to say beyond the fact that the rhetoric coming out of Iran has been constant. Um, I won't say it's increased, but it hasn't decreased either. But certainly they wanted to draw attention away from the difficulties that Bashar al-Assad is having in Syria. And to take that off the news agenda for a few weeks is not by no means any problem for them. And second of all, to take advantage of any problems within Israel, the fact that the Americans are in a state of flux post the election now. Nobody's quite sure who the new American Secretary of State's going to be and what attitude Obama might take 
towards Israel and the Middle East. Who's to know where we're going and what's going to happen? Everything is up for grabs at the moment. So Iran has deliberately and cynically taken the attitude they have. Um, there was also this incident in Sudan just a few weeks ago where miraculously, mysteriously, whatever you may say, a bomb-making factory was blown up. Israel has never claimed credit for it, but nobody knows if it was Israel or not Israel. But either way, the materials coming from that factory, it is alleged, were on the way to Hamas and to other groups within Gaza. And as such, the authorities, whoever bombed that particular site, knew what they were doing and knew why they had to do it. But the new military leadership in Egypt has got a lot to think of now. They have a lot of domestic issues to face. They don't know how and which way to carry on the peace treaty with Israel. And all these factors put into a real question mark what something that Israeli leaders have said for a long time. They live in a very difficult neighbourhood. Very much so, and uh, that neighbourhood seems to be uh, getting more dangerous by the day. And, and let's, also re let's also not forget that not only do Hamas pose a direct threat to Israel and the security of the Jewish state, but also pose a direct threat to the survival of the Palestinian Authority in Fatah and Mohammed Abbas. Um, and it's about Hamas that I, I, I want to talk to you about now, Jerry. Do you think with the um, media coverage of this conflict uh, last week, that now Hamas are portrayed in a different light. In particular, many people were provoked by what they saw of um, so-called uh, Israeli collaborators who were working with Hamas, who are believed to be uh, Israeli spies that were taken to, the, to almost the center of uh, Gaza and then murdered without any trial uh, or anything else, that this was probably a game changer in the perception of people's attitudes towards Hamas. Well, the footage of, sadly, one of the individuals, alleged collaborator, who, having been dispatched to another world, was being dragged, his body was being dragged through the streets of Gaza, it must have been seen by millions around the world. No question about that. But the real issues were simply that the people who, in Hamas, want to try and take advantage of Israel's situation, knew that they could ratchet up the situ general situation by just letting loose all the disparate groups in the area, not only Hamas themselves, but Islamic Jihad and a host of others, to let the rockets fire off in any direction and every direction, knowing full well that they weren't just attacking Israeli soldiers, they were attacking Israeli civilians. And for them, human life doesn't count as anything. If they lose a few more people within Gaza, they don't worry about it, they don't mind. They say, look how many people we've got, we've got a million people in Gaza, so, so what? And they cynically, as we know, set their rocket launchers up in civilian areas. Hence, when Israel wanted to take action, there were civilian casualties, which Israel, of course, regrets. But they do it in schools, in mosques, even the sports stadium. I, at the Palestinian Solidarity campaign meeting I went to the other day, there were complaints about the fact that sports facilities were damaged. I didn't interrupt their meeting, but it's very obvious why. And we've seen the footage on TV before of why the sports stadium is a pers uh, an area under the stands where all the rockets are kept and fired from. They use hospitals, they use schools, they use all sorts of establishments which are in civilian areas to fire their rockets. And this is something which now the wider public have been able to see and recognise from some of the very serious reporting that there's been. Even those commentators and reporters who have been based in Gaza were forced to show some of the rocket firing places from Gaza. Um, they know that whilst they're under the threat of Hamas all the time, they can't report everything they want to do. They were able to slip in enough footage and to show what was going on sufficient times to see, make sure that everybody could see 
what type of people we are dealing with. And can we trust the word of Hamas? Previous experience has shown not, and Israelis are well, well aware that every time they talk about a ceasefire, Hudna, it doesn't last that long. What is Hamas's aim? Time and time again, they are on radio, television, speaking to their own people, the elimination of Israel. We're not going to talk to Israel. Yes, we might have a ceasefire with them, but that is our, not our aim. Our aim is the complete liberation of what they consider the whole of Palestine and to set up their own type of state there. Mah Mahmoud Abbas and his Fatah movement must be worried because those moderate Palestinians have been totally outmaneuvered by this Gaza exercise and they will find it much harder to take over the reins of responsibility to try and negotiate with Israel while they've got the wild boys of Hamas with whom they have very little agreement roaming the streets of Gaza and are impossible to control. I've got a clip to go to now that um, says, uh, this says, um, so who do you think, so you think you know a lot about Hamas? 10 facts about Hamas. The Hamas is a Palestinian Islamic organization founded in 1987 in Gaza as an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood movement. The Hamas charter explicitly calls for the obliteration of Israel. The charter repeats medieval and Nazi anti-Semitic rhetoric accusing Jews of controlling the world media and of causing all the world's past wars and revolutions. Hamas is responsible for 40% of suicide terror attacks in Israel, which resulted in hundreds of civilian casualties. In June 2007, Hamas seized control over the Gaza Strip and began imposing an extremist religious rule. Hamas government is responsible for extrajudicial executions of all opposition, persecution of journalists, and shutting down human rights organizations. Hamas persecutes Gaza's Christians. Between the years 2007 and 2011, the Christian population in Gaza has dropped by 45%. Between 2001 and 2012, Hamas has fired 12,000 rockets into Israel, more than 9,000 of them after Israel withdrew completely from Gaza in 2005, and evacuated thousands of Israeli families in the hopes of achieving peace. Hamas war tactics include placing ammunition and rocket launchers in hospitals and mosques and near schools in violation of the Geneva Convention. Hamas is supported by Iran, from which it receives an estimated $300 million per year, military training, and rockets which are fired into Israel's civilian towns. The United States, the European Union, Canada, and Japan all classify Hamas as a terrorist organization. Uh, welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. Um, Jerry, uh, what do you think um, the Operation uh, Pillar of Defense will have on uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's re-election campaign in the Israeli elections in January? And what do you make of the news this week that uh, Israel's defense minister, uh, Hud Barak, is uh, standing down from public life and won't be running uh, for a seat in the uh, next Israeli parliamentary elections? Taking the first issue, Barak's... Oh, sorry, Netanyahu's popularity took a dip after the ceasefire. Whilst most Israelis were quite relieved there was a ceasefire, a lot of people, and you've got to bear in mind the country has shifted a hell of a lot to the right now. A lot of people said, you've got to go in and eradicate Hamas. Not the people so much, but their infrastructure. They felt that because of the previous experience with ceasefires had not been that successful. It's better to take all out all their facilities, their command and control centres, their weaponry, the people, not necessarily the individuals, but the communication systems they've got. Within a few days, that dip evaporated. Last Sunday, the Likud and uh, Israel Batenu, which is the more right-wing party, which are having a joint list for the elections on the 22nd of January, held their primaries. Well, the Likud part had their primaries. And the moderates within Likud found themselves pushed out. 
people like Benny Begin, whose father was the Prime Minister of Israel, Dan Meridor, another well-known moderate, all found themselves much lower down on the lists. The Israeli election system is not like the British system, where you have parties and individuals that stand in constituencies. They just have party lists in Israel, and they have primaries to select whoever they feel is most suitable to be in the Knesset. And if you're in the top few, you're guaranteed a seat. The lower down the list, you're less likely. Since the operation involving Gaza has ended, Netanyahu and his group of right-wingers have now shown that they would, in, if there was an election tomorrow, get 40 out of the 120 seats without blinking an eyelid. I said a little while ago that the left in Israel is decimated, it's split, it's fragmented. The result of what's happened in the last few months is that there is no main opposition party. The Kadima party is on the verge of disintegration, and it's always been a fact in Israeli politics that wherever there's a third party, it seems to disappear pretty quickly following election. The Israeli Labour Party, which used to be the governing party for the first few years of Israel's life, until 1977, it was the party of government. Those days are now gone, and Barak, who was its leader, oversaw the decimation of Labour. The new current leader, Shelly Yakimovich, has got a handful of individuals running with her at the moment. And were there to be an election tomorrow, it's estimated, and this is a worrying factor for those people who want to see progress on the peace process of a more moderate nature, it's estimated that the centre bloc, the right and centre bloc, would, between them, give Netanyahu a very significant 59, 50 to 59 seats in the Knesset without any problem at all, with the centre-left groupings way less than 40. And even with the Arab group of 10 Knesset members and all the associated uh, individual groups that there might be, that would not in any way provide sufficient numbers to be able to allow anybody but Netanyahu to be the next Prime Minister. So Netanyahu has, to all intents, got the election in the bag. The only thing that is unknown at the moment is the fragmentation that's going on with other parties. And I'll come to Barak in a second, because he's not the only player in all this. There is Sifi Livni and Ehud Olmert, the former Prime Minister. Ehud Olmert has, for the moment, decided, after his corruption trial, which he managed to get through and not go to prison, he's not standing in the election. Were he to stand, the opinion polls suggest he would not have done very well. However, he is known to be a powerful figure, not of the left, but of the centre-left, and would have got together all the different groupings quite easily to form a movement which would have helped counter the Netanyahu axis. Sipi Livni, who was the leader until she was deposed recently of Kadima, has set up her own party now called Movement, Hatuna. And she and a guy called Yair Lapid, another small movement in the centre, are trying to vie for the same area of votes. Shelley Yakimovich, who's the leader of the Labour Party, is also fighting for the same area of votes. And it's quite frightening. The more these smaller parties fragment, the less likely they are to pull together sufficient votes to topple or to at least give a run for the money to people like Netanyahu. On Barak, Barak realised his party, which broke away from the Labour Party some weeks ago, is finished. He has no chance of getting the 2.5% votes he requires for his grouping to even have one Knesset seat. Now, Israel has a strange way of doing its politics. You can be a minister 
but not necessarily in the Knesset. And the old saying that Israeli uh, that, that soldiers never fading away, they carry on one way or another way. That's going to be the case probably with Barak. It's a shrewd move. He's dissolved his effectively his party. He's not going to stand for the next Knesset. But he knows that come the day, 23rd of January, after those elections, the chances are Netanyahu can still turn to him, if Netanyahu wants to, to keep out more extreme leaders and put Barak back in as defence minister. Very interesting. So I think uh, we have to do a Middle East uh, report special on the Israeli forthcoming elections in uh, January 2013. Uh, we're down to the last 15 minutes of, of the programme, Jerry, and the one big issue this week really is the Palestinian bid to become a, a non-member state at the UN. I mean, we saw last September how uh, Mohammed Abbas wanted to declare a unilateral uh, Palestinian state that was rejected um, by in the UN General Assembly, and now they are trying to gain non-member status. Now, for the average viewer, this is very complex, it's very confusing. Um, can you explain the process and, and really what is the Palestinians' aims and objective of achieving non-member status at the UN? Let's wind the clock back just over a year. They wanted to go to the Security Council, which is the only body which can actually give them the status of a country. And they found, if they went ahead with that, they were told bluntly the Americans and the European countries on the Security Council would oppose it, would veto it, and therefore there was no chance of them getting their statehood that route. So they've used the procedures of the United Nations to get a second route, which is to get effectively observer status at the United Nations. It's non-involvement. It will allow them to be involved only in the agencies of the United Nations. And that leads to a complication, which I'll come to in a moment. But in effect, they will be able to go around and say, well, we're on the ladder now to getting our statehood. Um, it is true that the international financial organisations have recognised the Palestinians have now got the infrastructure to set up their own banking system and other facilities on the way to statehood. And they've given them a relatively clean bill of health. The economy is doing well in the West Bank. That's because Israel has lifted the restrictions which they were hitherto. A lot of aid money has gone in, mainly from the Europeans, virtually none, funnily enough, from the Arab world. But what is interesting is that they've gone to this stage. They know they've got a majority in the General Assembly. What they wanted to do was to bring with them as many of the influential European countries, which are so crucial to winning support globally. It's easy to pick up countries in the Asian world, mainly Muslim countries. It's easy to pick up African countries and many in Latin America. Where they've had a struggle, and a real struggle, is convincing the leaders of European countries to give them this boost of having a possibility of a foothold at the United Nations General Assembly. On Wednesday, William Hague faced Parliament and said quite bluntly, we're prepared to vote for this increase in representation at the General Assembly of the United Nations. However, we want it to be part of a peace process. And he laid down three very clear markers. One is that the Palestinian Authority agrees to go back to direct negotiations with Israel without any preconditions. Mahmoud Abbas has said all along, I've got a condition for sitting down at the table with Israel, that is the end to settlement building. And that has been a blocking factor in any chance for the peace process to advance over the last two years. It's been a real problem. Mm. The second issue simply was the advance that this gives to the Palestinians to get a toehold in other UN and international agencies, including the International Criminal Court. And the Palestinians are very anxious, so it is said, to bring Israel to the International Criminal Court for alleged war crimes. And Britain said, and other countries have said, we don't want you to abuse your right 
as a, a new observer status at the UN to go to the ICC and trigger that type of situation because that will kill off any chance of negotiations. There was a third factor which Mr Haig put down as well, which was about existing agreements. Israel has turned around and said, if you do this change status at the UN, it means effectively you're tearing up the Oslo Accords, you're changing the status quo, and as such we can't allow the Oslo Accords and all the negotiations with it to go ahead as if nothing has happened. So there's going to be a conflict here in any case. The bottom line is the, ele the vote will take place Thursday evening. This programme has been recorded before the vote actually takes place, but it's almost a foregone conclusion. It is understood that Britain will be abstaining and Germany will be abstaining. France and Spain will be voting in favour. The Americans will vote against. Israel will be very frustrated. The bottom line, will it change things? It depends very much on whether Mahmoud Abbas sticks to what he has promised, which is to start negotiations with Israel. If there are no negotiations within weeks, one knows that it was a ploy, possibly a cynical ploy, just to put Israel in an awkward situation. There are great debates amongst the jurists in the world as to whether the International Criminal Court can act and get involved in looking at Israel. Israel is not a signatory to the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction, but could still be taken to the courts. But then people could turn around and say that the Palestinians themselves are in breach of the Geneva Conventions and are responsible for war crimes and terrorist acts. So it's a two-edged sword. Nobody knows which way it's going to go. OK. We've got a, a news clip now that uh, looks at uh, the uh, Palestinian bid to uh, claim non-member status at the UN General Assembly, which will take place on uh, Thursday night. Many Palestinians here in East Jerusalem have their eye on New York, where an important vote at the United Nations will take place later this week. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas will ask the United Nations to upgrade the status of the Palestinian delegation to that of an observer state. Now, last year, he tried to get the Palestinians full state membership in the UN. That failed. Now he's seeking a status similar to the Vatican. Abbas insists that the move will help the Palestinians achieve a just peace namely an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. But Israel and the United States strongly disagree. Israeli officials say Abbas is violating the Oslo Accords by trying to get the world to recognize a Palestinian state before the terms of that state have been negotiated with Israel. By, um, by going through with this UN bid, the Palestinian Authority is breaking all the rules. We had an agreement, we have a framework, a legal framework uh, for our relationship, and now they're, you know, tearing it to pieces. The Obama administration also views Abbas's maneuver at the UN as undermining a peace process the U.S. has invested in for decades. During her recent visit to the region, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton made a last-ditch effort to convince Abbas to call off the UN bid. She reportedly warned that U.S. aid could be pulled. But Abbas did not back down. He knows he has enough votes in the 193-member UN General Assembly to approve his upgrade request, and the U.S. can't do anything to stop it. Unlike on the UN Security Council, the U.S. has no veto power in the General Assembly. Palestinian leaders justify the UN bid by saying they've grown weary of a peace process that yields few results. The current round of talks stalled over two years ago over the thorny issue of building in the Jewish settlements. But many argue Abbas's largely symbolic UN move will not lead to progress on the ground between Israel and the Palestinians. What's the point of all this? Palestinians will not change anything on the ground. They will not achieve anything by getting this, uh, this, this resolution for them. The only way they can achieve some progress is by, di by talking directly to us. And if they shun direct talks, then they will never achieve anything. This is what we're saying to our partners. You have to encourage the Palestinians to return to the negotiating table because it's the only way to push forward to negotiate peace and to achieve stability. The Palestinians do see a window of opportunity at the UN if they're upgraded to an observer state. They will be able to try to join other UN agencies, and perhaps most significant, they will be able to try to bring cases against Israel to the International Criminal Court. 
Those cases may not be accepted, but they will certainly grab headlines and build support among pro-Palestinian groups. With a Palestinian victory at the UN General Assembly all but inevitable, Israel is warning its response may be harsh. Obviously, if the Palestinians feel they're not bound by any past agreement or by any uh, gentleman's agreement or by any uh, accord, then neither are we. If they break the rules, then the rules don't hold for us either. And then we will take whatever measures we feel are necessary to maintain and preserve our security. Those measures vary from scrapping the Oslo Accords altogether to stopping the transfer of tax money to the PA, which would likely cause Abbas's government to collapse. The U.S. is trying to dissuade Israel from taking any drastic steps against the Palestinian Authority. It's likely officials in Jerusalem will wait and see what the Palestinians do next with their new U.N. status. Jordana Miller, JN1, Jerusalem. Welcome back to the Middle East Report. We've got uh, one more clip to uh, leave you with, and this was produced by the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C., that looks at the dangers of the uh, Mahmoud Abbas taking a unilateral declaration in declaring an independent Palestinian state free and outside of the peace negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. The tense situation still going on in the Middle East. The rockets continue to be fired uh, from Gaza toward Israel. The air siren did not go, and it's going on now, so we're just going to duck. Hello and welcome back to the Middle East Report. Uh, Joe, we saw in that clip there that uh, clearly the Israeli position is they're extremely unhappy with this um, unilateral action taken by Mohammed Abbas of the Palestinian Authority and, and, and really just pulls the two parties away from any future peace settlement and more towards antagonism and conflict in the future. It certainly shows... It certainly shows us a difficulty... Um, Nobody can quite work out what Mahmoud Abbas's game plan is. He's been very reluctant to disclose it to others. He's been under tremendous pressure from the British, for example, uh, who have been directly phoning him. Um, Nick Clegg, the Deputy Prime Minister, made representations to him on Tuesday uh, after William Haig spoke to him directly on Monday. And we know that lots of representations are coming from other sources as well, advising the Palestinian leadership not to play with fire because they never know what's going to be the final outcome of using this technique of trying to gain wider recognition. Yes, they're under pressure. Yes, they've got pressure within the Palestinian society to deliver. And they know that if they don't do something, Hamas are going to take advantage. But Israel realises that if they're going to sit down and negotiate, it's the only chance there is for peace. If there's no talks, there's no peace. Jerry, I just want to thank you so much for being my uh, guest again on the Middle East Report. Pleasure. And uh, I know you're very respected and very much liked by our viewers, so thank you very much. Thank you. And I want to thank you for watching today's programme. We saw that last week that his Israel was involved in a war against uh, Hamas which is a terrorist organization that's committed to the destruction of the state of Israel and its covenant charter calls for the destruction of the uh, Jewish people worldwide. And uh, now Israel faces another war, and this time it's a diplomatic war at the UN for a very, very survival. So it's important that as Christians that we stand up, we support Israel oh, and the Jewish people. And I'm going to leave you with this song called The uh, Bloody Truth about the realities of the Middle East. So he doesn't have to hunt us down globally. For it or against it? For it. Arab invasions, terror and poison.
caught. No UN vote will satisfy this lot. Palestine has proudly declared no Jews are allowed and nobody cared. The Arab Spring, civil war rages, liberty trampled, freedom in cages. 21 Arab nations and no human rights. Why vote for more Arabian nights? state has no peaceful perception it's just a base for bloody contention treaties come agreements go Balfour's dictate Sykes Pico Arafat saw slow blew up in our face Camp David Accords and last now a trace 4867 Jordan was king. No talk of Palestine, no one mentioned the thing. Where are Palestine's borders to be? They ought to be in Jordan by history's decree. So don't let the UN obscure the truth. Don't let false history corrupt our youth. This virtual state has no peaceful perception. It's just Best for bloody contention. If this virtual Palestine must be, what risk to Israel's security eight miles wide? Israel backs to the sea. Can Jews survive the UN guarantee? Well, dictators, raise your hands up to vote. Your women are shrouded, misogynist load. Marry the truth with your eyes.